Welcome back. Well, we left off last week looking at the evolutionist interpretation of the fossil record and trying to uh, figure out what the big deal is about the fossil record. Many evolutionists, of course, believe and teach and promote the idea that the fossil record is the best evidence for evolution ever. And um, yeah, paleontologists or evolutionists do not advance that kind of an idea, as we see from Dr. Patterson. Yeah, we studied the uh, quote from him last week. Now, we want to be fair to Dr. Patterson, okay? First of all, he had no idea we were going to get our hands on that information. And so um, his guard was down, although maybe that's totally fair. Um, but he doesn't really mean it in the way that we would think of where he's not trying to make a case that there is um, or, that, that, or that there are, you know, transitional forms. He's saying you can't make a watertight argument. He's not, you, you can't treat this as an absolute. And I think that's very wise, okay? So in his book, he has three examples of a transitional form between horses and rhinos, uh, some between fish and amphibians and archaeopteryx. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be able to study these things for ourselves and try and figure out what is actually going on. Now, I want to um, take a little break here and mention something that I think is, is also important. Okay, So first of all, we can study this for ourselves. Second of all, studying anatomy and bone structure and those kinds of things is an incredibly detailed um, discipline. Okay. So, you know, scientists who are experts in that field can learn an awful lot from the bones and the muscle attachment points and all those kinds of things. So I want to emphasize that even though we're able to look at this stuff, we should all, we should always listen to what the experts have to say and see, um, see what we can learn from them. Okay. Even if we disagree on when the organism lived and died and whether it's a transitional form, they, um, I have studied anatomy a little bit, okay, uh, comparative anatomy in, um, at the college level, and I can tell you it was one of the most difficult classes I've ever taken. So, um, so we need to be respectful of these folks that were, were trying to do their jobs, even if, even if they are promoting an idea that is hostile to, um, to our worldview, okay? So we're going to try and study some of this stuff for ourselves. Now, I want to bring up this um, supposed intermediate form here. Uh, this is an article from NBC News. So if you follow along, it'll take you over here. And I'm going to make a new screen share so you can see what I'm seeing. And uh, in this case, we're looking at an article uh, that was written by um, folks that believe that they found a ancestor of uh, horses, rhinos, and tapirs. Okay. Uh, and they think it might have looked something like that. Okay, it has four toes, and it's you know herbivore and all those kind of things. It has um, so so they believe that odd-toed ungulates, which is a, a fancy way. Well, that's horses and rhinos because they have an odd number of toes on their front feet. Um, they believe they evolved from even-toed ungulates like cows and sheep and all that stuff. And if you look at the picture of this uh, critter, you'll notice he has four toes on each foot and they find him in a low enough fossil strata. So they think they started out with four toes and then some of them have two toes today and some of them have one toe, that would be the horses and some have uh, three toes, that would be the rhinos. Okay, so that's their, that's their uh, um, pathway that they think that they took, okay? Uh, so, yeah, we want to note that they have found quite a few of these fossils, uh, approximately 200 bones, teeth, vertebrate, foot bones, etc. So they have a fair amount of evidence to go on. Nothing like a complete skeleton, but a fair amount of evidence. Uh, they think it's a cousin of living um, uh, parasodactyls. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And they think he, that he lived somewhere around 55 million years ago or so. Now, if you found a complete skeleton of this guy, 
you might notice a resemblance here to a hyrax, okay? This little guy, if you're looking at him, you'll notice he has a, a, you know, a certain number of toes here, which I believe, they, I believe he has an odd number, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he has these little pads on his feet, which are in some ways similar to a hoof. So, uh, and by the way, this is the uh, organism that Pikachu is, is based off of, I think, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I probably, I probably have that wrong. Anyway, uh, so a rock hyrax is this adorable little critter. They're very small today. Um, and uh, there's several different species of them. And you, you get the idea. Um, if this guy was five times the size that he is now, he would have a very similar um, anatomy to one of these creatures. Um, so I will point out that that could be what we're looking at is a an ancient um, hyrax that was that was bigger than the hyraxes that we uh, find today. Okay, uh, again, they do find them in 55 million year old rock. They think it gave rise to horses, rhinos, hippos, tapirs, and hyraxes. Um, it is worth knowing, noting that many evolutionists consider this animal to be a hyrax. And that's maybe one of the most important points that we can make about it. Um, the, the second one that I'll get to in just a second is that the evolutionists do not agree on this. Okay. So that is, that is always something to take note of. Why don't they? Why do they, why do so many evolutionists believe that this is a hyrax? Perhaps these are the more honest evolutionists who are looking at the skeletons or the bones, they don't have a complete skeleton of these creatures and thinking, you know, it's, it's basically a very large hyrax. Okay. Um, so perhaps that's, perhaps that's what, what they're doing. And this again is my point. You can't make a watertight argument about this guy. I mean, you can try, but really you're kind of admitting that you don't know what you're talking about if you do because there are so many evolutionists who disagree with you and you know they don't have um, a reason to disagree with you other than the evidence is just not convincing, right? So it's not, it's not like me and I'm gonna disagree with you because um, you know, it, this, this thing I, I believe is it's just ridiculous to, uh, to believe that it gave rise to horses, rhinos and tapirs because of the genetic evidence, uh, right? And of course I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm a young earth creationist. So, Naturally, I would find that evidence more convincing. But if you go to an evolutionist and they're still saying, look, the evidence is not convincing me that this is the common ancestor, then I think we have, um, what would you call that? A, you should have a favorable witness. What do you, there's a legal term when, you know, some witness uh, should be uh, biased towards you and they're not. And they're like, nah, nah, he stole the cookie. Um, yeah, okay, well, you can trust that person because they're actually going against their bias. They're not saying the thing they want to say. So maybe they are following the evidence a little bit more closely or at least being a little bit more critical of the evidence. That, that's maybe the best way of explaining what's, uh, what's going on here, okay? Now, they think this guy is in rock that's 55 million years old. And need I remind you, remind you, you, don't, you might not know this, um, that we find very good horse fossils going back uh, much older than that. Now, I will argue that horses are the only things that make horse hoof prints. So here in Uzbekistan, we have a report from a, a speaking of an antagonistic witness. Um, I don't, that, that, that's not the right word, but some other word. Anyway, somebody who should be, um, favorable towards evolution, the communists, right? Uh, they are reporting that they found 86 consecutive horse hoof prints found beside supposedly 100 million year old dinosaur tracks. Evolutionists have almost as much difficulty believing that horses and dinosaurs live together as they do believing that dinosaurs and humans live together. Of course, horses allegedly did not evolve until many, many millions of years 
after dinosaurs became extinct, but here we find their tracks in the same layer. So, um, and yes, these are, these are the definition of an atheist. There's no more hardcore atheist than a communist. Um, and uh, maybe we'll talk about why communists are such hardcore atheists when we get to our chapter on understanding humans, okay? Uh, which is a new chapter for origins this year. So hopefully I don't screw it up. <laughs> okay, uh, I have my uh, source here. This is a creationist source, but it is citing a source that comes from uh, communist Russia, all right? Now, we also have a witness that's much more close to home, and this is from a creationist, I believe, it was um, discussed in Creation Research Quarterly in 1989, you, uh, human and mammal tracks found together with the tracks of dinosaurs in Arizona. Again, um, I will argue that only a horse makes horse footprints, okay? Um, so if you're looking at this evidence, you might say, well, obviously there was a dinosaur that made a footprint like a horse footprint, and we just, that's the only fossil we have of that particular dinosaur. But you're not doing that because of the evidence. You're arguing that in spite of the evidence. And I think it's important that you're honest about that. That's just my opinion. Okay, so uh, horses and rhinos, not as impressive as you might have thought. Maybe the uh, young earth creationists are making it too easy for themselves. So let's move on to Archaeopteryx and see if that, if that particular creature will be nicer to them. He won't. <laughs> spoiler, alert, spoiler alert. So this creature was found fossilized during Darwin's lifetime. It was taken as very strong evidence in favor of evolution. The um, the initial case is pretty convincing. Let's have a look at this. And this is, again, is the one that's presented in every government school. So if you went to a government school, you have seen the case that I'm about to present. And it was presented to you as irrefutable evidence for evolution. And let me suggest to you that you were lied to. Okay. So first glance, we have what looks like a weak flying bird. Okay. So if you look at a skeleton, You've probably gotten a rotisserie chicken from Walmart before. That may be most of what you know about the anatomy of a bird, right? Um, he's got a big keel bone in the middle of his chest that the uh, breast muscle is attached to. That's the attachment point for that muscle. And so it has to be very, very large and strong. We call it the keel bone because it reminds us of the keel of a ship, which is, of course, the backbone of, backbone of a ship that you attach all of your other stuff to and you know provides you uh strength and direction to get through the water well archaeopteryx has a very weak keel bone so it seems like he doesn't have as much in the way of flight muscles as you might think it also so some people claim that it couldn't fly at all and maybe it didn't even have uh, very good feathers or any feathers uh they found a few um fossils of him during Darwin's life and it had something that looked like feathers but you know you know it's not really con uh, clear evidence so you can make what you know it's a blurry picture okay if it's a blurry picture well what is a picture of well, your bias can tend to show itself in those kinds of situations as to what you think that's a picture of well they thought it was a picture of f uh, feathers that were not fully evolved okay so maybe they Maybe Archaeopteryx used these feathers to grab on to insects and was an insectivorous uh, little dinosaur looking thing running around the fourth floor and used its long tail for balance and uh, it's got teeth in its uh, bill. It doesn't really even have much of a bill, okay? It has claws on his wings, okay? So maybe he used those to climb up trees and sort of jump from limb to limb as he's, as he's eating insects. And that sort of made a lot of sense uh, from the original finds of Archaeopteryx, okay? And they might have shown you in your government school a picture that looks something like this. Say, look, it's a half bird, half reptile missing link. And, you know, pretending like this is all the evidence you need to reject Christianity, embrace humanism, and uh, just behave yourself, right? Well, that's not what Archaeopteryx looked like. 
The original discoveries lent themselves to all sorts of interpretations. Evolutionists are speculating that lacking a strong keel bone, it could not fly. I had to climb up trees to lie down and catch insects or whatever he's doing. We uh, have found much, much better preserved examples of Archaeopteryx that have very strong muscle attachment points in the pelvis, okay? And uh, so we know, and that is key. How do we know? The evolutionists told us that Archaeopteryx is a strong flyer based on those muscle attachment points. Again, you can learn an awful lot about a critter based on his skeleton and those muscle attachment points that you find on the bones, okay? If you have a complete skeleton or close to a complete skeleton, well-preserved. So this guy was strong enough to take off from the ground. Now, he does have some lizard-like skeletal features that we do not find on birds that are alive today, what you might call a modern bird. It doesn't really have a beak. He doesn't have fused vertebrae in his spine. Again, if you've gotten that rotisserie chicken, you know that the backbone of a bird is fused together. So the bird needs a fused vertebrae in its back to provide a very stable platform for long-term flight. Archaeopteryx doesn't have this. All modern birds do. Okay, Archaeopteryx did not. All right. He also has a skull, which is attached at the rear, kind of like kind of like that, rather than from the bottom, which would, which would kind of look more like that. So our skull is attached from the bottom. Modern bird skulls are attached, not quite the way ours are, but sort of from the bottom. Um, lizard skulls are attached from the rear. And so, um, so yeah, he, he's, he looks a little bit more like a reptile than a bird, and so some evolutionists have argued that it's more reptile and bird and represents a true transitional form based on those characteristics. But how, how do they know? Well, again, we're not saying this guy is an Arctic migrator. We see many birds today that are perfectly modern, but weaker flyers than Archie. Ostriches and swans have clawed wings. Several ancient birds had uh, teeth in their bills. So what's the big deal? A again, I, I understand if you have a bias and you really want to believe in evolution for some stupid reason, I'm not really sure why you would want to do that unless you were really just trying to deny the existence of God. Um, why are you so committed? To why do you consider this to be hard evidence for your worldview? Because... You could also say, well, okay, um, this is really not looking like a reptile. It looks very much like a bird. Well, again, let's use a quote here from an evolutionist, possibly the world authority on birds, Dr. Alan Fiducia, very well respected um, ornithologist, an expert on birds. What does he have to say about Archaeopteryx? Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It is a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleobabble is going to change that. Wow. You do not find scientists making those kinds of absolute statements very often. Okay. <laughs> so should this be in the textbooks as some kind of evidence for you know, reptiles evolving into birds, not according to this guy. So he finds the argument very unconvincing. And again, that's my whole point. This is not a convincing argument. You're trying to act like the fossil record supports your worldview and it doesn't, okay? It's much more supportive of the idea that birds and reptiles were created as distinct kinds of animals and that they've always been distinct kinds of animals. And if you go back in time, you'll find birds with claws on their wings and you'll find some that have tooth in their bill, teeth in their bills um, and that lack fused vertebrae and stuff like that. But there was just more diversity amongst birds back in those days. Don't, don't we find more diversity among every living thing as we go back in time? Of course we do. So it doesn't surprise me a bit that we had some more variety in birds before Noah's flood, okay? 
Well, it gets worse for the evolutionists. We now know the Archaeopteryx had lungs identical to modern bird lungs with air sacs around them. Bird lungs are far more advanced than um, mammal lungs, and they ensure that oxygen-rich air is constantly flowing through them to support the higher metabolism of a bird. By the way, if you're an evolutionist and you believe or you want to believe for some reason that reptiles evolved into birds, this is an interesting thing I think you should try to explain to yourself, okay? You ever heard of a punctured lung? I, you probably have. Well, why is a punctured lung such a problem? Maybe you played uh, Halo, I think it's Halo Reach, where one of the soldiers gets hit with a needler. You know, I think it's a needler. Um, snipe or a needle rifle or something like that. One of those things. And uh, it punctures his lung. And he's like, <laughs> you know, he's flopping around. <laughs> he's telling his... Uh, Commander, leave me behind, boss. I can't make it, you know. And and his commander's like, you'll be fine. And um, does an emergency, you know, infield uh, first aid, which involves sealing the opening with this special kind of foam. Seals the plates in his armor, and he goes, oh, 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 I, I feel much better now. I, I think I can walk. <laughs> Why? Well, because your lungs, of course, work with a diaphragm. There's a muscle right under your um, the bottom rib uh, on you, which um, that muscle, the diaphragm, uh, when it contracts, it pulls down like that, okay? Pulls down like this when you breathe in. That muscle is pulling down and it's expanding the volume of your lungs, right? Which causes air to rush in. And when you exhale, you relax that diaphragm and it lengthens out, okay? If your lungs are punctured, you can't breathe in. So a punctured lung is a recipe for disaster because now you cannot move air back and forth into your lungs, into and out of your lungs. So if you're an evolutionist and you want to believe the birds evolved into or birds evolved from reptiles, you have to explain how they got holes in their lungs to lead to these air sacs and survived. <laughs> now that's a trick. Or somehow explain how the holes in their lungs miraculously coincided with the evolution of an air sac. So you have to have genetic information for a hole and the genetic information for an air sac evolving at the same time, which I think is kind of hilarious. But yeah, so, so really difficult to explain from a logical perspective or from a genetics perspective or from a fossil perspective. And if I may say so, it's actually a lot worse than any of that. Modern birds are sometimes found in the exact same layers as Archaeopteryx, and in some cases, even lower than Archaeopteryx in the fossil record. A bird, which is unquestionably a true bird, has been found, which dates by the evolutionist's own methods at 60 million years older than Archaeopteryx. We have known about this longer than I've been alive. So I'm absolutely shocked that Dr. Patterson included Archaeopteryx in his list of transitional forms. He should know better. Nobody should even be talking about Archaeopteryx. Okay, it's kind of an interesting little critter, but it is definitely not a transitional form between birds and reptiles. Every evolutionist should know that, but they don't. They leave the example in the textbooks. I wonder why they haven't removed Archaeopteryx from every government school textbook in America as irrefutable evidence for evolution. To the point that if you're watching this video and you believe in evolution, you thought that Archaeopteryx was just an ironclad, well, finally, we can shut those stupid creationists up kind of an argument in favor of evolution, and it is the opposite. Okay. It is just another example 
of a perfectly created organism with all the right equipment to fly. Slightly different than modern birds, but again, this is, this is not. If you believe that he evolved into modern birds, how come you find modern birds lower than him in the fossil strata? Professor John Ostrom of Yale said, we must now look for the, ant this is um, 10 years before I was born. He says, we got to look for the ancestors of flying birds in a time period much older than that in which Archaeopteryx lived. And again, we're quoting from um, a creationist um, source, but they are citing a source that is atheist, science news. Uh, which you, you feel free to go look up. Many, many libraries will have an archive of that magazine. You can look it up, feel free to do so. So a more accurate picture of Archaeopteryx might look something like this. And I submit to you, this guy flew over your car and pooped on your windshield. You wouldn't even notice that he looked funny. Probably not. Again, long bony tail, kind of weird looking bill, uh, claws on his wings. But, you know, okay, so if you're, you're saying that he evolved to lose his teeth and lose the claws on his wings and shorten his tail, that's a, that's your evolution? I don't know about that. So I consider Archaeopteryx um, a pathetic example of an intermediate form. If you use it as an example, you're displaying your own ignorance of the argument. You don't know what you're talking about. And I have run into... Experts in the field who still want to use Archaeopteryx as some kind of evidence for evolution. And that's wrong seven or eight different ways. Archaeopteryx is unquestionably a bird. Archaeopteryx unquestionably had all of the modern features of birds. That is fully formed flight feathers, uh, strong flyer, and air sacs around his lungs. Um, and he exists in a layer that is too high. We find modern birds millions, millions, and millions of years before Archaeopteryx, and we've known about it for almost 50 years. Wow. Now, when I was in college, my professors tried to convince me that I was wrong by using Archaeopteryx. And I brought up some of these arguments and they, you know, did the same thing that every human does when their religion is questioned. They got extraordinarily frustrated with me and mad. They just got mad. And I was like, look, I don't consider it a convincing argument. Archaeopteryx is, is a pathetic argument. Surely you have something better. And um, right about that time, the first news stories of Archaeoraptor came out. Oh, yes. And my professors, particularly my anatomy professor, Dr. Nancy Halliday, who is one of the most intelligent people I have ever even heard of, what a, what a godly and incredible woman she is although she believes in evolution, okay? Uh, she brought me the articles of Archaeoraptor and wanted me to read them thinking that finally this would be evidence that would convince me that birds evolved from reptiles. And I read the articles and I pointed out some very interesting things about them. First of all, all the pictures in them were this big you know, like thumbnail size. So you couldn't really expand them and actually look at what they found. That to me was a warning sign. Why didn't they? They found this awesome thing. If I found an awesome thing, I would want high resolution pictures of it to be taken so that everybody can look at it and study it, right? If I'm a scientist, that's my, that's my whole goal is to share my discovery with the world. That's not what they had. They had little little thumbnail of the critter that they found. And I looked at the skeleton and I was like, I can't make heads or tails to the skeleton. I don't know much about anatomy. I noticed that it came out of China. Now, again, I'm biased. I think communism is the worst form of government ever to exist on the planet. I think it is the greatest evil humanity has ever done to other humans. I think it's a great evil to the environment as well. You show me a communist nation, I will show you an environmental disaster that covers the entire nation, okay? So I'm biased and I admit my bias and I propagate my bias, okay? I will defend 
my ideas about what democracy and a republic should look like against communism any day of the week and twice on a Saturday. But it is true that it turned out to be a hoax. <laughs> That's what I told my professor. I was like, look, this has a tiny little picture associated with it. Only Chinese scientists have examined it. And I read the article. One, one Chinese scientist has examined this. You haven't examined it. You have. Now, if you looked at it, I might consider that a, a compelling argument. I trust you. You're an intelligent person, like ridiculously intelligent. I mean, she's probably got a thousand IQ. She doesn't have it, but it, it, it's extreme. She's got an extreme amount of education. She, she has been teaching for, I think at that time, 25 years or something like that. Um, and, she's st and she's still teaching. She does a great job, okay? I learned so much from her. And I, but I was trying to impress on her, look, I trust you, but I don't trust this guy. Why don't you go look at the evidence and see if it's really convincing? Why do you just automatically trust this dude because he says that you should? Well, she got really frustrated with me and, you know, because she felt that it was overwhelming evidence. And I was coming from a historical perspective where I understand we've all been here before. Well, I, yeah, you think it's overwhelming evidence? I, I've heard that. Yeah, I heard that about Archaeopteryx. I heard it about Cro-Magnon Man. I heard it about Nebraska Man. I, I heard it about all these critters. And when you go and you look at the evidence, it's just pathetic. Some of it's out built down, man. An outright hoax. Well, this is an outright hoax. National Geographic had to recant their story about Archaeoraptor. It turned out that it wasn't even that great of a hoax. Something about a lizard's butt that got glued onto a bird's head. Okay, <laughs> which I think is hilarious, personally. Okay, you don't find creationists doing that. When we find fossils, they're not hoaxes; they're they're real. We you know, look at um, Malachite Man. That's a real fossil. You can go you can go and study it. It's been studied by many experts. Okay. Yeah, so how often is it that some kind of overwhelming evidence this will finally shut those creationists up gets discovered, it's examined by two or three people and trumpeted throughout the press as finally we have found the evidence that we've been searching for for hundreds of years. And then somebody with two brain cells rubbed together gets to examine it more carefully and turns out to be nothing, nothing at all. Well, there's a long list of those. Now, our last example, yeah, so Archaeopteryx is yeah, not even close. Our last example is the link between fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Okay, so uh, I should say between fish and amphibians. So apparently fish evolved into amphibians. That is the belief system of the evolutionists. And I don't hear this one nearly as much as I hear Archaeopteryx or Lucy or, or any of the other supposed transitional forms. And so I always wondered why that was. And I tried to do a little research, try to figure out some of this stuff. Well, first of all, let me say, and I have a, I have a, um, a, a link here you can check out. There's, there's readily available information, excuse me, information that's out there on the subject. Um, first of all, I'm not qualified to examine it. I just don't know enough about anatomy to know what I'm looking at, okay? I have to trust the evaluations of the experts because to me, it looks like a bone. And if you, you know, threw one into my dinner plate with my rotisserie chicken, <laughs> I probably wouldn't notice, right? So, so I have to trust the experts on this one, right? I can tell you that many of these fossil creatures are known from less than one bone. They have found a little piece of its jaw and they think it's a transitional form between fish and amphibians. And I think that's silly. Um, I've read the reports of many of these scientists and best I can tell their major argument is that it's a transitional form because it has gills and lungs at the same time. Which every, uh, which every amphibian has at certain points during its life cycle. And I think that's probably why a lot of evolutionists just kind of stay away from using this as some kind of evidence for 
a transitional form. Because again, we are reminded of Dr. Patterson's warning that there's no case to be made that is watertight. And so maybe you shouldn't argue that the fossil record supports your worldview because it really, really doesn't, okay? To the point that many evolutionists believe in Stephen Gould's theory about punctuated equilibrium rather than believing in a slow, gradual evolution by mutation, right? Yeah, so, so I will argue that it is, yeah, a basically a modern amphibian that they're classifying as some kind of transitional form. And um, you can read about it, fish to amphibians back and forth and see what you can make of it. Listen to the experts, what do they have to say? Is it a convincing argument, right? They hold it up and say, it's a transitional form. And you say, well, why do you consider it's a transitional form? Well, it has lungs and gills at the same time. And you say, well, don't all amphibians do that at certain points in their lifespan? And they're like, yeah, why are you so attached to this thing? Maybe because you're looking for something that really isn't there. And that is the transitional forms that you have to have for your hypothesis, your uh, philosophy to be scientifically credible. Well, you don't have that evidence. So I would say it's not scientifically credible. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, and hopefully we'll have time to cover one or two of these uh, today. We're gonna to talk about some of the supposed transitional forms between apes and humans, or you might describe them as being common ancestors of apes and humans, okay? It's important for us to realize that almost all of the missing links are still missing, okay? The oldest fossil bat is a bat. No transitional forms leading up to the vertebrates or many of the mammals. Whales are a good example of that. Bears are a good example of that. Um, there, there's just not any transitional forms leading up to the cats or the dogs. Um, flying reptiles, plated fish and squids, woody plants, sharks, et cetera, et cetera. Appear, apes and monkeys appear in the same layer, layer suddenly they live in the same place, don't they? Um, suddenly, with no transitional forms to speak of, okay? And it shouldn't be that way. It should be very easy to look at the fossils and show me thousands and thousands of examples of transitional forms. And you got three, and I just picked apart your argument pretty hardcore about 15 minutes ago. So if a backwoods native science teacher from Oklahoma who makes his own bullets can pick apart your argument that easily, it can't be that convincing. You're trying to say this is science and I'm trying to show you what you believe is a philosophy and the only reason you believe it is because you want to. You have no scientific justification for this, right? Okay, so we're gonna look at some of the supposed common ancestors between apes and humans. There's a video which I would very much like for you to watch by Dr. Don Patton on the subject. He does an excellent job of summarizing this. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but I wanna leave the heavy lifting to him as it were, okay? Australopithecus afarensis, often cited as a transitional form between apes and men or a common ancestor is also known as Lucy, okay? Lucy is a pretty complete skeleton. It's. 40 or 45% complete. That's a pretty big deal in paleontology, right? There's a lot we can learn just from those bones. But if you looked at all of the supposed fossils that have been tried to be shoehorned in as some kind of a common ancestor for apes and humans, all of the bones would fit in a single coffin. And when you consider the multiple billions of individuals that must have lived and died over the last three or four billion years of human evolution, so-called, uh, that's not a very good number, okay? Um, so very few uh, skeletons are complete. A. afarensis is an ape, okay? Now, they initially found this creature, and um, it was right in the about the layer of sediment that they were expecting to find. <laughs> oh, so they found something that they were intentionally looking for, eh? Well, they, they found this critter in about the right layer of strata. 
for it to be a common ancestor between apes and humans. And the hip had been crushed, okay? Possibly right before the organism was fossilized, possibly as a result of fossilization, lots of pressing, something pressing down on top of her, like, I don't know, a mile of rock might crush uh, her hip. It is a female, okay? Um, and so they said, well, if you rebuild this critter a certain way, you get an ape that might have been able to stand up, okay? Now, that's a big deal because apes and humans anatomically are very different, all right? So, for example, the structure of our hips, speaking of. Um, your hip bones, your I think they're called the iliac ridges, go forwards like this, right? So you can put your, you know, <laughs> if you're skinnier than me, you can easily find them right about where, on, where your belt sits uh, on either side of you. Those are your hip bones, right? And your, your uh, I think it's the iliac crest. And they go forwards like this because they're creating a massive socket for all the muscles of your leg, right? And then your acetabulum right there is where your femur attaches to the hip, okay? And so that means if, you're, if your iliac ridges are running this way, you can kick your legs out to the front of you and behind you. So your legs swing this way and you can walk in a bipedal manner. Apes cannot do this. Their hip bones do not go forwards like so. They splay out to the sides. You, uh, you can look this up. I won't take the time right now, but their but their um, hip bones splay out like so because they're designed to swing through the trees like this. Okay, if, if the if the ape is facing towards you, it's swinging through the trees like so, and so it's using its feet in a side to side motion rather than front ones and backwards. It's a totally different system to ours, but it's perfectly designed for what we call an arboreal. Uh, lifestyle, which is a lifestyle in the trees, living in the trees to escape from predators and things like that. So, um, so that is a major difference between apes and humans, the structure of our hip. Okay. Lucy's hip had been crushed. So you could put it together the way it was actually fossilized. In which case, Lucy's hips look like this, and they look very much like an ape hip. And what are we actually looking at here? Or <laughs> you could take apart the fossil, or not the fossil, you'd make a cast of the fossil and then re, um, then take that apart and re put it back together. And if you put it together that way, you end up with a hip that's somewhat similar to, or shall we say more similar to, a modern human hip, but even that hip, it's really hard to argue that Lucy was bipedal and walked somewhat similar to modern humans, okay? Um, so even the most hardcore evolutionists would look at that and be like, okay, so if, if Lucy is the ape that stood up or of that group that stood up, then she didn't really walk in a bipedal manner, not the way that, not the way that we do. Again, if you look up pictures of Lucy, I won't because usually they make her a lot more naked than the typical ape is. So uh, we won't do that here. But if you look up pictures of Lucy, you will notice every single picture has one thing in common. In every picture, she looks an awful lot like an ape that has human feet. The original fossils did not have feet. The feet are not preserved. So speaking of artistic license, Dr. Patterson, um, how come they put human feet on every picture of Lucy if they have no evidence that she walked with feet like us? Well, I'll tell you why, because in a similar layer, they found what they call the Lotoli footprints. The Lotoli footprints are unquestionably identical to modern human footprints. And what makes human footprints? Humans. Oh, or apes with human feet. Yeah, so they gave Lucy human feet, even though the preserved specimen of Lucy had no feet, right? 
So this is kind of sounding like a bit of a stretch. What about this fossil is actually human? If you study the skull capacity of Lucy. Now, it is true that skull capacity in humans is um, not exactly correlated with a measurement of intelligence, which might seem kind of odd, but that is true. Just because you have a bigger head does not actually mean that you're smarter, okay? <laughs> but our average skull capacity is about 1,440 cubic centimeters, okay? Range for an ape is about somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 cubic centimeters up to a maximum of about 400, maybe 450 on the really large size. Okay. Lucy's skull capacity is about 325, 350. Well within ape range. Okay. So she does not have a human brain. She has an ape brain. That's for sure. Uh, if you look at her finger bones and her wrist, she has the ape finger bones and wrist. The wrist, of course, in apes is load bearing to hang from a limb. Very painful for a human to hang from one arm for very long. Most of us uh, probably can't do that for more than a couple of seconds, um, especially as we get older and heavier. But for Lucy, this would have been very easily because her arms and wrists are specially reinforced in order to do that, just like every modern ape. The finger bones are also curved. So if you look at your finger bone and you do that, you'll notice that your finger bones are straight. Human finger bones are straight. This enables us to do all kinds of things, uh, tool making and grasping and signaling and knife hands and stuff like that, that apes cannot do. When an ape's hand is completely relaxed, they're curved like this. Because every bone is curved. This is an advantage if you're grabbing onto a limb, but it makes you very bad at throwing things. You can teach an ape to throw things, but they have extraordinarily poor aim. Humans can aim with deadly accuracy with their thrown objects. We're basically the only animal that can actually do that. Okay, and one of the reasons, because when we throw something, we can extend our hand like that and we're not throwing like that, that would be a very serious disadvantage for a human. So if you're going to hunt and throw javelins and spears and arrows, all those kinds of things, it would be a serious disadvantage for you to have curved finger bones. Lucy's bones in her fingers are curved, just like every modern ape. You can study Lucy's collarbone, load bearing again, as in every modern ape. You can do a detailed study on Lucy's inner ear. Apparently, Lucy lacked the basic equipment for balance that is found in humans so that we can walk upright. That is a lot harder than we think it is. If you've ever taught a young uh, infant uh, toddler how to walk, you know all about that. That It's a real challenge to get, figure that stuff out. Well, it would be impossible for an ape. An ape cannot actually do that because they do not possess the balance necessary to do it. Okay, so the skull capacity, ape, shoulder bone, ape, wrist, ape, finger bone, ape, hip, looks an awful lot like a modern ape, foot, non-existent in the initial finds. What are we looking at here, ladies and gentlemen? It's a duck, right? <laughs> um, this is an ape. Obviously, I will mention something that Dr. Don Patterson, uh, excuse me, Dr. Don Patton Patterson is the, is the, part of the previous guy. Um, uh, something that he explains in great detail is we have found many, many other examples of Australopithecus afarensis. Many of them had very well preserved feet. They look like this. They're all ape feet. So of course they put them in a different species than Lucy. <laughs> oh yeah, these ones are older. They hadn't evolved the uh, human feet yet. May I submit to you that if you've been shown pictures of Lucy with human feet and told that she made the Latoli footprints, you've been lied to. That is not the truth. That is not the truth at all. We found a whole bunch of more or less complete skeletons of apes that have been fossilized 
The ones we find with feet have ape feet. The ones we find with hands have ape hands. The ones we find with their skulls preserved have ape skulls. The ones we find with shoulder bones have ape shoulder bones. And the ones we find with hips have ape hips. Just throwing that out there. I will also point out that there have been many outright forgeries and hilarious mistakes when it comes to supposed intermediate forms between apes and humans. Java man is a good example of that, an obvious ape skull with a human femur. They weren't even found in the same layer. And so most people have never even heard of Java man anymore because that one actually was taken out of the textbooks and they made a mockery of the scientists who, just, who claimed that he had discovered them and all that kind of stuff. Um, Nebraska man, of course, uh, some, uh, sci not, not a science journal, but a newspaper, which again, you can't necessarily trust what's in the media. Um, they had a newspaper uh, article with a picture of the guy and his uh, wife, apparently. Oh yes, this is Nebraska man, an intermediate form, a uh, uh, primitive human. Turns out they based that whole thing off of one tooth. And when they went back and did some more excavation in the area, they figured out the tooth actually belonged to an extinct species of pig. <laughs> I think that I can't remember who said it, it was like when that when that came out, they're like, well, that's one example of a, of a pig making a monkey out of a man. <laughs> yeah, so the gentleman that found it was very embarrassed. And uh, yeah, he thought the people in Nebraska looked primitive, I guess, but uh, no, those are perfectly good humans. And yeah, the fossil you found actually turns out to be not even belonging to apes or humans. So shame on you for trying to shoehorn that in as a transitional form. Of course, Piltdown Man um, is a complete forgery. They uh, found this thing. The expert, all of the experts of the day agreed that it was ape human halfway in between they locked it up in a vault for 40 years and did not allow it to be examined by anybody is that suspicious or what i would call that suspicious well when it was finally gotten out of the vault and re-examined it turned out to be only about 100 years old it had been artificially stained to make it look older the uh skull was modern human and the jaw was modern ape, which they had put human teeth in and filed them down and forced them to fit. It wasn't even that great of a forgery. Okay. So why, why are the experts, and I, and I know people like Dr. Nancy Halliday would have looked at that and torn it, torn it to shreds as soon as, as soon as she saw it. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced. Why are all these people who are trying to do the original research to go out and find missing links, why were they so much, so easily deceived? I submit to you that they knew it was a forgery the whole time. That they didn't have anything else to put in its place. And so they locked it in a vault and said, oh, it's built down, man. It's a transitional form. Well, they found Neanderthals about the same time. Neanderthal, of course, is a valley i believe in germany where they found these folks um neanderthal of course uh the initial the initial find they only looked at a single example now they had lots of skeletons they eventually found a dozen or so of neanderthals and there have been other sites that have been excavate excavated that are of neanderthals okay they looked at this one example and that's the one they put in the museum and they dressed him up to make him look really primitive. And they, they gave him heavy brow ridges and all this kind of nonsense. And um, yeah, the person who re-examined it said, wait a minute, this guy is all bent over and stuff because he's suffering from extreme arthritis and vitamin deficiencies. I think, he had, uh, I think they call it rickets where your bones are deformed because you don't have enough, uh, I think it's calcium in your diet. Um, I could be wrong. Anyway, this was a really old, kind of malnourished single example. Everybody, yeah, the guy that put it together was a real bonehead. Apparently, he had the ankles on backwards and 
made all kind of rookie mistakes. You know, it's kind of like probably what I would have done if I were trying to shoehorn together some evidence like, oh, look, it's a primitive human and just throwing a bunch of bones together. Um, yeah, just a uh, very sloppy, very sloppy work. Okay. When you go and you look at groups like Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal, it is unquestionably human. Need I remind you that Cro-Magnon had a larger average height and brain capacity. Neanderthal has a larger brain capacity than is average for humans today. Average height of six foot five, brain capacity of 1,600 to 1,700 cubic centimeters. You're trying to say this is a primitive human? He might have had a little more horsepower upstairs than we do. It's possible anyway. Java man, of course, has been thrown out. 1470s skull. Yeah, it's a modern human. Hate to break it to you. Tarkana boy, again, modern human. They <laughs> went out and found this skeleton. They're like, oh, it's a transitional form. Well, it's in the layer that's supposed to be transitional forms. They couldn't really find anything about it that was ape. They were a little bit surprised at how tall he was. For a 12-year-old, he's uh, five foot six, I think. But they later figured out, based on a detailed study of his skull plates, that he's only nine, nine years old and five foot six. So devolved. <laughs> Apparently, we've devolved since then. And I leave you with this diagram here. Okay. I want to emphasize that when you dig up the bones, the fossils, mineralized leftovers of bones, um, if you didn't know any better, you might say, well, this is, uh, you know, the evolution of this horrible little chihuahua thing into a pug that has at least some respectable bite force into a French bulldog that evolved to a bull terrier, which finally made it to a Burmese mountain dog, then the Kali, then the German. It would be easy to build yourself a little sequence going from smallest to largest, weakest to strongest. When in fact, all of these dogs came from this guy right here, which is a wolf. Okay. All that genetic variety was originally in the animal. And um, yeah, this is the evolution since then. Okay. All right. So I want you to watch the video by Dr. Don Patton uh, this week. And uh, let me know what you think about it. It's a pretty, it's pretty, good, uh, pretty good show. We'll pick up where we left off in transitional forms later on. See you next week.